Welcome, 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 Tony Lopez. We're so glad to have you back at Wesleyan, even if it's virtual. Uh, to um, be here. Um, so we're talking today with our auditions class, and um, and and we're really informal. And um, cool. so I'll we, you and I can have a conversation and just kind of let it be free form for about half the class, and then we'll open it up to the students to ask any questions they have. They're very excited because you're our first BFA actor. Oh, yeah, um, yes, because the so, two that have come before have been music theaters. Okay, so how many people, how many, what percentage of the class is? is uh, I think the class is pretty 50 50 um, because we have senior BFA actors and junior BFA actors, and then we have junior music theater majors. Okay. So cool. it's, it's pretty, uh, like all the seniors, with the exception of Angie, who's my TA, who are uh, that are in their last year are all BFA actors. Okay. So they're excited to hear from you. Um, so let's start with, okay, so Tony, because I came in your senior year, so you were already a big rock star by the time I got here, and um, and my first show actually at Wesleyan was with you as Scrooge, and um, so let's talk, a bit about, yeah, let's talk a little bit about your time at Wesleyan, because you were here from what, like 90, like 2004 to like 2008 is when you graduated, so um, I can't believe that's been like 14 years, but... Um, Remind me, Scott. <laughs> You look exactly the same. You've not aged a day. Thanks. So, yeah. um, so let's 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 talk a little bit about your experience here and, and all those things. I I've been very clear with our alumni guests that are coming in to please not shy away from things that, you know, were failures or that that didn't work for you or that didn't help you in your mm-hmm. journey because you know we're educationally if we're gonna if we're gonna get better at what we do we have to constantly be changing and growing and we have to be aware of those failings. Um, I've, I've had, you know, I had the Portland summer, so I got to hear a lot of the issues that you had, but I'll let you, uh, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you share all those things. So let's just start with your experience here, why you came to Wesleyan, what you got out of it, what you studied. Yeah. I came to Wesleyan because I knew some of the professors who were working there already. I knew that I was going to get a great education, um, and that we were sort of, without even being able to articulate this at like 18 years old. I came to Wesleyan because I knew that there was kind of like a, an aesthetic or like a, a skill. Uh, there was a match between me and the faculty. I knew that like, I knew that that we kind of spoke the same language already because some of the faculty, I was lucky to have worked with some of them in high school. So uh, I came to Wesleyan for that also because they gave me some money um, and it was pretty close to home because I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. So there was that. Um, like skill wise craft wise like i got such an incredible education a very well-rounded education um in terms of like just you know what i do but then also the history of what i do like i got a great education in the history of theater and um just in talking to people that i've met throughout the years like not everybody had that no, the academic, the academic side of it, which like I really love and I think actually helps me um, in like my work. So yeah, so there was that. Um, one of the things that I think was a challenge for me when I got onto the real world was that there was this kind of expectation when I was in school that um, I would be able to make a career out of acting on stage. And I know that a lot of people, some people can, but when I got onto the real world, it like hit me across the head that a lot of people, even people who are like on Broadway, occasionally have to take day jobs. Like you will be like, I can't tell you the the number of times I've like gone to see a show or whatever in, you know, Midtown, gone to a restaurant before the show, started talking to the the server and found out that they like have been in six Broadway shows. Right. And when I was younger, that like, and I found that out, gutted me. I was like, oh no. Cause that was like the height, you know, for me, like Broadway. So um, the good news is though, that it is possible to make a, a career out of this, to support yourself. Um, it is, it is very possible. It just takes a little more diversification of the markets that you get into. And that's why on-camera technique helped me a lot. And I don't know if like, like uh, Wesleyan didn't prepare me for, for on-camera stuff. 
No. But I bet, I mean, I bet there's an on-camera class now. I would be well, there, curious. There is an aptitude for the camera, Tom teaches it, but we also now have a film minor. So we, we, we've got a lot more going on than when you were here. I still think it's like everything, Tony, we have a lot of work to do. Um, so we still have a lot to do with that, but yes, we are understanding that they have to get some more experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so on-camera stuff was, was lacking for me at school. Uh, An education about like, just what it's like, the, the admin stuff, taxes, uh, unions, agents, all of the, the, the details that go into all of those things. And of course, everybody's experience is different, but I think those things are pretty much like universal for everybody. Taxes, right. unions, agents. Um, those are the things that I had to learn like on the fly. Awesome. Well, that's a lot of what this class is too now. And it wasn't when you took it. It was more of like a, let's do monologues. Um, Very much. Very yeah, much. I remember. <laughs> so yeah, that's awesome. So you were a BFA actor, but you know what? You had, like, I, I've already said this to them. You're a great singer and, and a great mover. And so um, why BFA acting versus music theater, even though like, you know, I'm very proud that you started your career professionally in music theater. Um, <laughs> I'm actually, Nick Williams is gonna be one of my guests this semester. Yeah. I was next to him, that is so crazy. Yeah, so, cause you know, I'm, I'm literally reaching back to all my friends. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, and former students. Um, but I, I will say, um, yeah, so why, why that? I mean, where, what in your mind, in your 18 year old to 22 year old mind, what did you think you were gonna do when you got out of here? Because I, I certainly had a plan for myself that was nothing like what actually happened. Um, and I had a great career, but it wasn't what I had all imagined when I was in school. Yeah, same. Um, when I was 18, I loved musical theater. Um, and I really wanted to be that like star center stage arms outstretched like belting that's that's like that's really what I wanted but I knew that because I have a disability I wear a prosthetic leg that it was probably smarter for me to go into BFA acting um because you know also like I loved that too like I grew up uh like going to see Steppenwolf shows and I just assumed that I like I would be one of those people um because I knew that like a, a investing time and money into a into an education in musical theater i was going to miss miss out a ton of the dance stuff that i just like couldn't do so even at 18 i was like aware of my limitations in that sense okay. but then i went to school and i did a shit ton of musicals mm -hmm. like my, first, my first show i was like as a sophomore, I was like one of the leads in Urinetown. In Urinetown, right? You were you were Caldwell, right? I was, I was Caldwell, yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty like it was pretty half and half. Like I did like mm -hmm. I think I did, including like black box shows. I think I counted. I think I did like twenty seven shows at Wesleyan, and like half of them were musicals. Right. Um, and that was great. And then yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I, I, that's good to know. So okay, so you got out. I've told them a little bit. So when you got out of school. Your first gig was a national tour. Well, my first gig was, I did uh, summer stock in Colorado for- a, Oh, that's a, right. What did you, what, I forget what you did. What did you do in- um... I, did, I did Neil Simon's Fools. I did uh, Mystery of Edwin Drood. And I did uh, Life is a Dream. Right. And we're doing Life is a Dream this next year. We just announced that as our next season. I love that play so much. Yeah, Tom's going to be directing that next season. So, oh, um, so he's yeah. been wanting to get his hands on that for years. Oh my so, God. But yeah. yes, I, did, I, I worked in Colorado for a couple of months. Um, I had a couple of offers from Uptas, um, but I decided Colorado, and then I got the offer to do the national tour. And like, I had to, you know, you, you have to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, okay, so what would you say? So you've said a, a few things that were limitations. What were some of the things that you thought surprised you that you felt like you were more prepared than you than maybe the people when you were looking around. Not that I like for them to look sideways. I'm always saying don't look sideways, look forward and look at yeah. yourself. Um, but um, uh, 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 the like thoroughness of technique, acting technique, objectives, uh, actions, those kinds of things, scene work, breaking, being able to like scene analysis. Those were things that like a lot of people that I worked with early on and still today 
don't know how to do. Right. They don't, like a lot of people are just like, I don't know, I just do it and it, whatever feels right, you know. Um, and also like, like I said, like academic stuff, the history of theater, the history of acting, things like that. That stuff fascinates me and it helped me. It has helped me and continues to help me a lot. And I learned, I learned all of that stuff at Westland. Um, so well, yeah. What do you think is the, be the, the best piece of advice that you wish you had gotten um, in early career? Like what, what do you wish that somebody had pulled you aside and said, Tony, you need to know this? Uh, take care of yourself. Yeah. I really wish that somebody had, had impressed that upon me seriously, because this career, if you are lucky enough to work a lot, uh, demands a lot of your energy and a lot of your time. And I, and, and a thing that I heard a lot, uh, when I was in school and then also like, right when I started to work was like, if you don't love it, then do something else. You know, everybody, everybody used to say that all the time. I don't know if people still do, but oh, I don't say that because there's lots of times you don't love it. So, you well, know. I mean, and you okay. have to not love it sometimes. It's okay to right. not love it sometimes. Right. I mean, it's like any relationship. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, that was like a big deal because I kept, I, there was all of this like inner conflict in the first few years that I was, that I was working where it was just like, I kind of don't like this, you know, whereas like all, all, all up in my whole life up until that point, it was the only thing that I ever wanted to do. And then I start, I sort of found myself being exhausted all often taking auditions for things that I wasn't really inspired by, you know, um, not taking care of myself, you know, just like blasting, trying to, trying to just hustle as much as I could. And I burnt out and I had to take like a couple of years just off. Um, and then, and then I found, you know, slowly I'm still working on it, but like finding the balance between like being okay with myself and you know, giving like an appropriate amount of energy to the, to the, the thing. Well, that, that sounds like a great life lesson. And, and, and I'm glad that you're sharing that with them. Cause I do think that we all say that, but I don't know that it always sinks in. So hearing things like that from people that are out working is really useful. You're gonna burn out. I mean, you know, and everybody, everybody experiences that it's okay to burn out every once in a while. You just have to know that like, it's okay to take a step back, you know, opportunities will still be there. Well, one of the things that impressed me about you, Tony, from the very first time I met you, and, I, and the first day I met you was your audition for the fall of your senior year, and you were very firmly like, I am not auditioning for this and this and this in the way that you constructed your audition. I mean, not that you got up and said, I will not do those things. You just made it very clear what you were not going to do. Second semester, though. Huh? You did that second semester. You did? Well, no, second semester, you said, I'm not auditioning because you took the option out, right? I, I auditioned, but I said, I will audition because I have to, but, I'm, but I, I don't want to. Right, and they still had that ability, right? They had that ability to like to petition to say, "Hey, this is I, why I want to do that." But the first semester, because remember, it was for Broken Jug and Scrooge and um, what was that man with the hat or whatever that lab show was, and so um, Broken Jug was was you know a show that a director was doing that you were like, "I do not want to work with that that person," and you had very good reasons. Was um, it? it was Sven. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so and so I, we don't have to unpack that, right? We don't need to. We don't need to air our dirty laundry in front of everybody. But what I, the, my point was that what I was impressed with that day because I had not met you yet, right? You gave this great audition, and I was like, Tom, like he's gonna be Scrooge, right? And um and but what I what I was I, I think what I was enamored of in that moment was that you had a real sense of yourself you knew who you were and granted that's that changes right we we grow and we change and we become new people constantly we're all constantly recreating but at at 22 or however old you were at that moment you might have been 21 um you knew enough about who you were what you had to offer and what your skill set was and you were very comfortable at least in the exterior with who you were and and i was blown away by that because it's rare that i meet someone that young who's got like this is who i am um, and, and I want to know, why do you think that is? Why do you think that you had such a, a sense of self and how to personalize and how to put yourself in the work and understand that, you know, the more you know who this is, the more you can be released and free to create? Well, I, I honestly, at 22, there was a lot of delusion in there <laughs> and a lot of uh, lying to myself and, um, all I knew was that when I, 
stepped onto stage, it was like, you are going to see everything or you are go where I'm leaving. Like, you know, that, that was, I don't know. So that place was your place of safety. That place was your place was, of freedom. That's it. That's it. I did not feel safe everywhere. I didn't feel safe alone. Um, and when I went onto stage, I felt safe. And I felt like it was the probably only looking back now, probably the one of the only places I felt really actually safe. Wow. Okay, well that that does make sense from what you know from my perspective as an audience member, as a as a director, as somebody who was sitting there watching your work. Makes me a little sad about the rest, but you know, I know yeah, that things are better. Sad. Lots of therapy, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but, but it's so, good, that's good to understand because I do think that there was this there's this freedom and ease in your work. And you know, and I've I've been fortunate enough to get to work with you a couple of times and 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 in really not the best of circumstances. And so um and so I think I'm I'm just marvel with your ability to kind of really focus. I want to talk a little bit about you know, and and this is always a little bit of a messy subject because, um, you're you're a lot of things. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know physical disabilities and about how you feel about ableism and how how you feel about your particular situation um, shaping you as a human, but also shaping your interaction with the industry. I, I mean, I, I'm really even kind of uncomfortable with the term, you know, disabilities, because I feel like that we're ever evolving about language and how we talk about things. And that that is such a huge, I mean, from anything from neuro differences to, you know, things that are apparent or not apparent, I'm a wheelchair user, or someone like you who has a prosthetic, but that doesn't have to be apparent, right? It, yes, it depends. Right, right, it's choice. Right. But also, is it your choice or is it their choice? And how do you negotiate that? I'm I, this. I'm very privileged in the the scope of disability because I can pass. It's, uh, it's that's like there's a certain level of like if if I don't want you to know, you might not know, and that is a privilege that I have. Um, that's that not everybody has, but. Uh, I didn't really even get involved in like activism or, you know, whatever uh, in the, the disability space until recently when I started, um, when I booked things that got more attention, when, you know, when I started getting more, more eyeballs on me and more opportunities. And I realized that like, there's a huge disparity for people with disabilities and the representation, the lack of representation in the media for people with disabilities, as with all marginalized groups, contributes to the oppression of these people uh, with, you know, who come from marginalized groups. Um, in 2018, I just gave this big talk on disability to the uh, Shakespeare Theater Association, so I like have all the stats in my brain, but um, so a quarter of uh, uh, a quarter of people living in the U.S. are disabled, but only eight percent of the new roles written in the media are for, uh, are, you know, are these characters are written with disabilities, and only a fraction of those characters are played by people with actual disabilities. Right. So it says a lot about fear. I think the fact that a quarter like over one in four people in the country are disabled and yet people are still afraid to see actual disability in front of them, it says a lot. So I think for me, it's very important to be forthcoming about my disability from here on out uh, and to just raise awareness. So that's, that's like, that's, yeah. Is that everything I guess that's everything, yeah. Awesome. Well, can we also talk, so while, while we're delving into all of your business, uh -huh. um, that's the nature of this, you know, so so that I bring people in because I want students to see themselves yeah. in, in success and in failure and in humanity. And so I can, I only represent like old white guys. So I got to bring in everybody else. Um, so let's, can we talk also, also about um, queerness? And can we also talk about, um, uh, I mean that you're Latinx. I mean, you know, like the, you, you, you are a lot of things that may or may not be apparent, um, mm -hmm. and may or may not be something that shapes or changes how you interact. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm queer. I'm gay. Uh, always have been. Um, 
And I think, you know, a, a lot of this too is like, as an actor, we get, uh, you know, I get to, I, I have to match whatever the role is, you know? So, and a lot of times I, you know, probably 95% of the time I'm not going in for a queer character. Mm -hmm. So I often have to butch it up. And you know, <laughs> you know that term in a long time. I'm so that's an old school term, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have I have older gay friends. <laughs> it's like that's like, like my generation. I'm like, wait, Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Um, like, no, I mean, so butching it up is like it's fine, whatever, you know. I I was shocked when I started working in like the higher level stuff that like almost nobody is outwardly queer. I I remember one time. I was doing Othello at New York Theatre Workshop with uh, Daniel Craig, David Oyelowo, uh, Rachel Brosnahan. And there were several queer guys in the show. I was the only out one. And I remember one of them pulling me aside at the end of the, at the, end of the production and saying like, I'm so impressed by you that you were just able to just be out, be yourself. Even in this like tight family of, you know, actors, we were like working together, like rolling around with each other for like several months. I was the only out person. That's amazing. In 2017. Yeah, it that's was, what's weird. Blew my mind. So like, there are a lot of people I think who, if they're privileged enough to be able to mask their disability, they do that. If they uh, feel like, you know, they can mask their, their uh, non-straight uh, sexuality, they do that. Um, and that's everybody's choice. And I would never s encourage people to come out of the closet if they're not ready. But uh, I don't feel comfortable lying, uh, you know, about about who I am, you know? Not that like, if I'm in an audition, I'm gonna be like, hey, nice to meet you, I'm gay. You know, like, I'm not gonna do that. And they can't ask, you know? Um, but like, I feel that it's really important to show up and and feel comfortable about who I am and be be open about it, you know? Tony, where do you land on this that you need, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a big proponent, obviously, I, I'm, I try to be the, the most um, kind of informed ally can be for marginalized groups, right? I mean, and I fail constantly and, and I, you know, could go off on that whole, I contribute to all the problems and I do, but I try. Um, but that being said, and, and this being a messy conversation as they always are, um, how do you feel about, uh, people who are not gay playing gay roles and um because i feel like I, I that is something that's still a hard thing and i think that may be a generational thing because i my most of my career in straight plays which is funny in straight plays was playing gay men uh -huh, yeah. um and so and i wouldn't want anybody to take those experiences away from me because they were really amazing for me um i'm excited about this new film coming out with stanley tucci and and i mean and, and you know so it's it's a weird thing for me how do you feel about it as somebody who's openly gay. I think representation is really important. So I don't like to make any hard and fast rules about this stuff, um, but I do think that uh, we, need, we need to see just representation matters, not just for like our own personal sense of being seen and, and feeling validated, but also like it, affects things like legislation. It affects things that actually impact people's ability to make money and people's rights in society. So we can't just think of it as something that is like optional, really, like representation yeah. really does matter because it affects people's lives like, like in the most foundational way. Awesome, that's a great answer. Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit more. Can we talk a little bit now? We're out of Wesleyan, we've graduated. We're we're super fortunate because, and we, I'm, it's the royal we, I'm talking about you, sure. um, that you're you're working and then you get off that tour and you go to New York City and? I was nobody. <laughs> Remarkable. That was so fucking crazy. Being like, nobody prepared me for that really. And I, you know, I, and I, you, I, you said it. Definitely, like probably, but you know, I was, I was one little voice. Yeah, 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 you might be a big deal here, but once you go out into the real world, you start auditioning for shit. You're you're nobody, and uh, that was really true. And I and um, I didn't quite realize that 
it wasn't just necessarily about talent because I had talent, but then like everybody else had talent. Not everybody, but you know, yeah. lots of other people had talent. But it, it's not about that. It's not about, I mean, here I am, this like, you know, 22 year old, 23 year old, no, I was 24 at the time, um, disabled, bald dude, you know, with like kind of a baby face at the time. Nobody knew what to do with me, you know? And this is something that you said to me too that I think about all the time. Oh no. Well, you said, you know, he, you, you were very encouraging of me and, and, and supportive of my skill and my talent. The talent is huge. Thank you. And, and one of the things that you said to me was the, the market might not know exactly where to put you until your face catches up with, you know, the rest of you and the rest of the rest of the market. And I, that is, that is true. I think that is true. Um, you said 45, which I think, you know, I'm halfway there. I wasn't 45 yet. Now I would say you don't have to wait that long. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and the other thing too is like, I have played younger people. That's, it wasn't, yeah, yeah. it wasn't a hard and fast thing. And I, and I have, you know, knock on wood, like I've got a career and I'm, you know, supporting myself. But, um, but the things, things like marketability, um, understanding that people are going to see, people always see actors as a product and that's just capitalism because you know it's one thing when you're like acting at school and it's just about your talent and what you bring to the audition but it's a totally separate thing when you're auditioning for people who need to sell your image to make money for themselves and they and what really helped me was like i took a day job um in marketing I didn't know I was just like I, I need money and here's an opportunity and a, you know typing and whatever but like um I took a I took a day job in marketing and I and I learned about marketing and I learned about uh the rules of marketing and I took that and I was like this is fucking acting this is you know so that helped me understand how to package myself it helped me understand how to dress for auditions how to um how to put myself out there on social media and the internet, how to, you know, think of myself in discrete brands, you know, for myself. So um, that was like the experience of initially like landing in New York and having to experience this stuff, you know, on the fly. But a lot of it too was just luck. So much of, so much of my career was just total opportunity, you know, and I credit Wesley with, with being able to like show me like, oh, this is an opportunity. Now work. And here are the things that you have to do right. to make the most of the opportunity, you know. So Yeah, what I like to say is that we we're we we can't do everything for you in eight semesters. But the one thing I hope we do do for our students is let them understand that it's all about being prepared for the opportunity, whatever that opportunity may be that shows up, because that's the thing that's indeterminate. Yes. And I will say most people who have careers say it was luck because it's very hard to map what the actual trajectory was. It doesn't, it doesn't always follow a, a linear path. It's not a ladder. It just kind of goes all over the place. And when you think everything's going to fall, you know, is falling apart, then suddenly you have the big break and then everything does fall apart. Um, and so, um, and it's not, um, I mean, hopefully the, the like trajectory, the like overall, you know, graph goes like this, you know, but it really feels like. Yeah. Cause you can't see it right until you, until you're looking back until you're, you know, until you are Christopher Plummer and you're looking back at the career, you don't know because you're in it, you're living it, right? It's your life. Um, let's, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of things uh, before we open it up to the students. One is you, you've had a variety of things. So you did end up getting into, you know, film and television and some pretty high level theater pieces and still are, you You continue to work in, in classic theater and very commercial theater as well. Um, I've really enjoyed some of your voiceover stuff because your voice is very distinctive to me. So when I hear it suddenly, I'm like, oh, that's Tony. Um, and um, um, and, and you're, you have this wry sense of humor. You've always had a really good sense of humor about yourself and taking yourself, like I think you do take yourself seriously, but you also have no problem poking fun of yourself. Um, and so the, some of the more comic things that you've done, like commercial things have been, have been entertaining to me. 
But how do you, how did you navigate that? How did you find those things other than luck? Cause they're all thinking, oh my God, what is this gonna look like and what I'm gonna do? And also in that, can you talk a little bit about how you face, I know that's a lot, but unions and starting yeah. to understand unions and agency and having, you know, finding an agent or finding a manager and, and yeah, just anything along those lines. I think the best way to talk about this is just to sort of map out, like there were like four discrete steps that had to happen for me to like get to from like no union, no representation to like representation and union. Awesome. So I moved to New York. I had a friend who uh, had gone to NYU, make friends with the people who go to NYU, the people who go to Carnegie Mellon, find those people because they know everybody. And everybody- The doors are open. The doors have been flooded oh. for those people. I always say to people, they're like, hey, should I go to CMU? I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> go to grad school, you know? Right. But I'm also like, you know, when people are like, oh, I'm trying to decide if like, no, you're not gonna come to West Lane. You're gonna, there are certain schools that can open doors that we just can't. Yeah, yeah. And just because of like where they are. Right, oh, it's proximity <laughs> and it's also history, yeah. Yeah, so um, anyway, I went to high school with somebody who wound up going to NYU, wound up being a, like a star director in uh, NYU undergrad, was writing a show, um, a musical, asked me to audition. I auditioned. I got like one of the leads in that show. Uh, this was the second year that I was living in New York. And um, it was off, off Broadway, non-union. Nobody came to see this thing, you know, whatever. One of the people that I met in that show was uh, a bartender. Follow me. So she's a bartender. She's six feet. She's absolutely gorgeous. She's working at a bar. Somebody says to her, hey, you're gorgeous, I'm an agent, come audition for me, ask one of your friends to audition for me, uh, or audition with you, do a scene. And she asked me, and we did um, Frankie and Johnny, we did a scene from Frankie and Johnny. We worked our fucking asses. I mean, I was, I like, I had three jobs at the time, so it was like, you know, 10.30 at night, we're like, let's, let's work on this fucking scene. So we, we worked on the scene, we auditioned. I got the agent, she didn't. <laughs> um, and then, so, okay, so th this agent's like, let's work together, okay, you're non-union. She's like, you're gonna be one of my like, um, what is it called, development projects or whatever. So I worked for her, I started auditioning more, not a lot, but more, after about, two years, I get an audition for uh, the NBC showcase, NBC uh, new talent showcase, which is a thing that I don't know if you guys talk about, but it is a major platform and a major opportunity for lots of people starting out. I was non-union at the time. I booked the, the NBC new talent showcase. Okay. And it is a showcase where uh, relatively unknown people have a scene written for them and then you perform the scene one night for agents, casting directors, directors, other agencies, you know, all their networks, like all of these, this huge, like um, this huge media, uh, you know, event. So I did that. I got a commercial agent out of that. Uh, I wound up meeting a ton of casting directors who wound up calling me in over and over. Um, and then like through that, people just, I think, you know, it's like your name starts to just sort of go up in right. the algorithm. And then uh, somebody reached out and was like, hey, we're doing this off-Broadway show. Do you want your equity card and do this play? I was like, yeah, okay. And then that was how, that was how I got my equity card. So it was really like one thing after another, but over the course of three or four years. And so you're, you're, you're AA, you're equity, you're also SAG-AFTRA. Yeah. So that's a lot of union dues. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's worth it. It is worth it. Um, and and are, do you get most of your your health? I mean, I'm, this is for them, so they understand that these are things we're talking about because they were things that your generation didn't talk about. Yep. But also, so do you get your health insurance and things like that through the union and you're able through to that. use through all that. your unions to make that happen? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I have been on Actors' Equity Health Insurance, which you need 11 weeks for six months of coverage. 19 weeks for a full year. 
uh, with SAG-AFTRA, you need to make a certain amount of money for, you know, to qualify for, for certain levels of coverage. So, yeah. Okay, well, I, 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 wanna, I wanna say like two things before we, I open it up for them. One is, what do you think is your favorite role you've ever done and why? And, 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 and what did you get out of it? Scrooge, dude, I'm sorry. Ah, I didn't expect that, but okay. <laughs> it, was, it was my favorite just because it, like I was on stage for three hours. It was you, man, it was all you. Oh, I know, I mean, and I was, I was totally burnt out by the end of it. And I, I, you know, it was, I struggle bust a little bit after that for several years, you know, not because of Scrooge, just because it's like being 23 and burning out and, you know. Right. So, um, but Scrooge, the the play like is not excellent, but the message is of like transformation and 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 like learning that giving and caring about other people actually matters. You know, like for whatever reason, it just lit me on fire. Like that show, that role, just like totally was like. And I think about it all the time. I think about it all the time. So that's one. The other one was I did um, a play a couple of years ago at New York Theater Workshop called Light Shining in Buckinghamshire mm -hmm. by uh, Carol Churchill. And it was one of Carol Churchill's, Carol Churchill's early shows. Rachel yeah. Chopkin directed this. And uh, I, I played a, a soldier in that. And um, it felt like, I'm gonna get a little woo woo. It felt like, like the spirits of the people that we were portraying were just like coming through and um that that was that was huge and i got a shit that was carol's work or do you think that was rachel's work carol the tone. carol yeah. carol rachel just got out of the way i mean rachel just rachel just well, said, and i think that's a big thing for directors right i'm hey for all you aspiring directors because there's a couple in this room did you hear that sometimes you just need to get out of the way you just need to let the work be the work um, you know, and it is about casting too. It is. Oh, about absolutely! Casting. You have to put the right people in there, but sometimes you just gotta have to get out of the way because I think that sometimes we think we have to steer the ship a little too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was okay. Let me just give you one little anecdote that just really like just was like, uh, um, I was working on this show. It was like the week before I was the the week before you know we, uh, we started, and there was a scene at the end of the show where my character was just like totally destroyed everything taken away from this guy and i was playing it like fighting you know fighting holding on and one of the things that she that she did she was like you know it was hard for her to communicate in words what she wanted from me she's like but instead of fighting maybe it's this and she just did that like it was just like mindlessly doing something like mindlessly tracing her finger on a bottle, right? And it was like, I get that, I get that. That is not a fight. That is, I'm lost, I'm lost, you know? So like, that was, that's something that, and for some reason I always go back to that, that moment of like, sometimes it is just Michael Chekhov, a physical gesture, you yeah. know? So I think she, I think instead of trying to articulate it, she showed it, you know, and that, yeah. That was everything. awesome. That's awesome. What do you, what do you think is one of your your least favorite experiences and why? Uh, there are many. Um, definitely, like you know, having to be on a set for something where you know it's non union, you're getting paid one hundred and twenty five dollars, and you have to be there for sixteen hours and not act you know just right. like like one time i did this like id you know uh id channel thing where i had to play like a doctor you know a kid had like some kind of worm in his brain and i was like the doctor helping him or whatever and i was there for 16 hours i got paid 125 dollars, and it was just like dude i can't you know i can't do it i can't do this but you know when you're young and you're like you know you're new and you just want to that on camera experience you just feel like you know but yeah stuff like that you know um just didn't feel like it was worth my time, you know? So we're in this time of plague right now, right? We're in this pause. Everybody likes to give it some name, intermission, whatever. I, the one thing I love about it is that, you know, history tells us, as somebody who said you enjoy history, that there will be a renaissance, right? After a time of plague and pestilence, we will have a renaissance. So this may be a very exciting time to be an artist. 
um, very much so as we, you know, when we get there. It's the getting there that's really, and the patience to get there that's really difficult for all of us. Um, so I know we're in a pause. What are you hopeful for the Renaissance? What are okay. you hoping will change? Uh, I've lived in New York for 11 years. And when I first moved here, the like, um, the, the McDonald'sization of New York had really just started like where I was really thinking about rent all the time, but nowhere near, uh, to the degree that I was like, uh, five years after I moved to New York, like money became such a barrier for artists living in New York over the, the last 10 years. What I think will happen now, and I've started to see this as I'm looking to buy a place in the city, uh, real estate prices have plummeted. Yeah, it's a good time. It's a great time to move to New York without money. Yeah. But when I was younger, but you know, before I moved, I thought, oh, I can go to New York broke. People have done this forever. Like show up to New York without any money and, you know, and just try to make it work and, and you know, the book a Broadway show and boom, you, that, that's it. It wasn't that way. I mean, I was not prepared for how much of my mental energy was going into like just the dollars, just the paycheck to paycheck for so long, so many years. But I think now commercial real estate, they said something like 60% of um, commercial buildings are empty. Yeah. From before. Uh, the pandemic. Well, so people can work from home and they're going to keep working from home. So some of that's not going to change. Some of that's not going to change. You know, that's, that's exactly right. And so what's going to happen is a lot of these places are going to turn into um, cheap, cheaper housing. Mm -hmm. So people without a lot of money will be able to come to New York and actually make it happen. That's going to be the Renaissance. That's going to be the creative re Renaissance in New York. And I can not wait. I'm so excited. Oh gosh, I love having you here, Jenny. Okay, I'm gonna open it up. Let me go to not out, out of speaker view so I can see all of, look at all these bright, shiny faces. No, I wanna know what you're thinking. Um, okay, so raise your hand. Who wants to ask Tony, Tony a question? I, Pearly, Pearly is a senior BFA actor. Hey, Pearly. Hi, Tony, thanks for talking to us today. My pleasure. So I know, yeah, I'm, you earlier, you mentioned like stuff about social media. I wanted to know how you use social media to your advantage to help market yourself and like any tips you would recommend on us doing that. Yeah. Um, post, post interesting selfies, uh, you know, but post selfies. You know, okay. Like what would be an interesting selfie? Put yourself looking good, but not um, have some kind of like funny thing to say or important thing to say, you know, that actually like reveals something about you and what you think about the world. Um, post regularly, post when you have something interesting going on, mm -hmm. uh, but it, like always brag, always brag. I cannot tell you how when I'm like regularly posting mm -hmm. things, like updates about things that I have going on, my auditions multiply. Oh. Just because I've made contacts with casting directors and, and you know, uh, directors and things like that. So they see all of this stuff and then and they're like, oh, he's working, oh yeah, him, you know? And then they call me in. Um, that's so would really this be Facebook and, I'm so sorry, <laughs> would this be Facebook and Instagram or any other platforms? Yeah, I mean, wherever your following is, you know, wherever your bigger. Oh your following is what else um i have uh, unfortunately like ran into several people who have booked like a tv spot or whatever posted that they worked on the show and be like hey watch the show tonight and then their scene got cut so oh. you know, like post that you worked on it um but then really post the screenshots after the thing airs your name is spelled correctly in the credits and your face appears Good to know. Thank you. So, Tony, what's your what's your handle? How can they follow you? Well, on Instagram, I am Flittergaggett. I thought that's what I was going to say. I think you're Flittergaggett. I just didn't want to say it. Flittergaggett, but... Okay. Um, okay, I think next up was Alexis Jones. She is a junior music theater major. Hi, Alexis. Hi. So my question is, um, can you talk to your experience as a person of color in theater and then any um, advice that you have for 
younger BIPOC who are going into this field? Well, this is tricky because I, my last name is Lopez, but I was raised in like a mostly Italian background. My family is far enough removed from our Mexican ancestors that um, unfortunately colonialism kind of encouraged them to move away from their Mexican heritage and embrace the whiteness. So there is a lot of Mexican heritage that I am missing in my upbringing, which I have worked hard to like go back to and, and rediscover, but I can't claim, um, you know, I pass for white. And, and so I, I, you know, this is something that like, I have tried hard to like make sure that I'm sensitive to when casting directors or whatever are calling me in for, for non-white roles, you know, for Latinx roles and just being like, this needs to go to somebody who can speak to this heritage more than me. Um, it is that, that, that that's so important what you just said and because we are at such a multiracial um different experience group of people right now and all these people that are coming up are and it's probably, certainly that our students are figuring themselves out and many of them are coming from very white very suburban experiences where they are removed from any kind of cultural connotation to what they're their heritage is so that was thank you for sharing that because i think a lot of people are not talking about that particular issue and yeah. it's one that a lot of our students are dealing with yeah yeah so you know um i mean discrimination is real and white supremacy is real and we are all uh, affected by it and um activism is is very important you know, I, I talked about this earlier, but like making sure that representation happens is is a, a big is a big part of this. So yeah, I'm sorry I can't be more specific. Thank you. I think that was an awesome answer. Who else? Who's got their hand up? So I can I can only remember Dylan. Dylan Dylan Holt is a I was gonna call him Dylan. That's just a pet name. Um, Dylan Holt is a a junior music theater major. Hi Dylan. Hi, Tony. So you mentioned earlier that at one point you had three jobs in New York. Um, I was wondering if you'd share a little more about your side hustles and, you know, what you did, what you liked, what you didn't like and all that fun stuff. This is something that I wanted to talk about more. Um, so thank you for, for asking me about this. I, okay. So I worked retail. I slung coffee for uh, a couple of years, as well as doing a lot of personal assistance stuff because I learned really quickly that like you needed to know the people with money. So like I wound up, I like looked for uh, personal assistant jobs to like try to get some of that rich people money. Um, so like I, you know, that and and you know, fortunately one of the people that I that I worked with, he couldn't write an email to save his goddamn life. So like I was his assistant, I was writing emails. He was like, oh, you can write, you should do the social media and the copywriting for this. A cookie company. I was like, okay. So I started doing it. I became the social media manager for Tate's Bake Shop, the like Tate's Cookies. So I started doing that. I did that for a long time. I took a couple years off. Then in 2017, they asked me to to do it again. I'm still doing it. I, you know, it's, um, I don't need to, but I like extra money. I'm trying to buy an apartment. And uh, so I am making cookie money now. Um, and I have been for, for about 10 years. So like, uh, it's, if you can do it, if you can spare the time, if you can spare the like psycho emotional bandwidth, uh, uh, you know, get in, get in with something, get in with something good, you know? And I, like, I can't say enough how my experience in this like marketing realm has helped my acting career and how, and vice versa. Amen. That, that's some good stuff. Okay. Uh, Josh Kuyping is a junior BFA actor. Um, I was just wondering, Scott mentioned that you were a, a really multifaceted artist. So I was wondering if you had any tips on how to like market that when you have different interests, should you focus on one or let everyone know that you do a lot of things? Um, do you have like a specific, like a uh, specific areas that you're, that you're interested in? Hmm. So like, what are your, what are some of your? Um, I act, I like directing and I also do carpentry. 
Oh my God. Like, that's incredible. Like, uh, I mean, yeah, if you love doing carpentry and like directing, like direct movies, put the stuff that you make in your movies, make really interesting stuff that you put in your movies, you know? write little scenes that you can post on social media that incorporate like you're directing your acting and your carpentry you know um the the market right now is like pretty wide open because of social media so like if you are a maker combine them and put them all out there you never know you know one of the things that like has has been great for me is like uh, this is just going back to like the hustle thing um really trying to get in with commercials and voiceover. I can't stress it enough. TV residuals are good. Commercial residuals are life changing. Um, so get in with that. Awesome, these are good questions. Okay, who's next? I gotta look up so I can see with my bifocals. Oh, that is incredible. Oh, old man. Oh. Um, Megan Boggs is a, a junior uh, BFA Music Theater and she's my first student from Hawaii. Oh, yay. Hi, Megan. Yes, hello. Oh. So I hope this question comes out right. I, it's, my brain is going lots of places. But like mm -hmm. one of like the big takeaways that I'm getting from this conversation and something that's like really inspiring to me is very much so how um, true to yourself you are and seemingly so in your projects. And I kind of just want to know, like, how do you navigate staying true to, you know, like that activism side of you um, when you're taking on projects and like just making the projects also align with everything else in your life, even when you're trying to make money as a yeah. struggling artist? You know, Megan, um, I am fortunate enough to be in a position for now where I can be very selective about the things that I say yes to. Um, it hasn't always been that way. And I think probably one of the only reasons that like I can say no and be selective is because like when I, you know, for the first whatever, 10 years, uh, whatever of my career, I was just like doing everything, just trying to do everything, everything, saying yes to everything. Um, so, but like, you know, I did this like Shakespeare thing a couple of years ago and I was working with this person who was, you know, 50 and I was telling her like, oh, I have to go home and make this self tape. She's like, you're upset about having to like audition. And I was like, and I thought she was going to be like, you should be grateful for this audition. And I was like, yeah, I know, no, I know I, I should be grateful, whatever. And she's like, no, 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 no. She's like, you don't have to be just grateful for everything that you do, but if it doesn't light your soul on fire, why are you doing it? You're not gonna represent yourself well, you know? Um, if you're not interested, they're gonna see that. So, you know, um, she's like, and I, I, she's like, I learned this a long time ago, like only say yes to the things that, that light you up. So I think there's a certain level of privilege to being able to like live by that advice. But at the same time, I think it's always something good to like just have in the back of your mind that like if this aligns with my values and actually like makes me excited to act, then, uh, you know, pour everything into that, you know, um, and don't be afraid of being heartbroken. Like the world is heartbreaking and uh, honor that. And um, I struggle with that a lot. I struggle with being able to be like, you know, my heart's broken. I'm enraged, you know. Um, but I find that when I do honor that stuff and and uh, yeah, then and accept that about myself, then then the work is better and I feel better about myself. I think that's that is super good advice. I hope that's sinking in, folks. Um, that I think that's really good stuff because I think um, it's so hard. I mean, that balance of saying yes to everything and just hustling. And also saying that, and you may say yes to something and somebody else may say, well, I would never say yes to that, but it's not their path, it's your path. So yes. staying on your own path is really important. And also giving yourself grace if you do something that you're like, oh, now that I look back at that, I wish I hadn't. That's okay. That just means you knew, you you learned better, you knew better, you you evolved and became a different person. Um, who else? Okay, who's next? Come on, people. Cause you know, I can, I, I can suck up the whole time and talk, but I know y'all have questions. Zoe Mendoza is a junior uh, BFA actor. 
Hello, Zoe. Hi. Thank you for being here today. Um, I just wanted to ask um, what your opinion was on um, like moving to like Chicago or those smaller cities before making the big jump to like the bigger cities. Is that the way to go or does it matter? You search the market is my uh, gut response to that. I know a lot of people who move to New York and really struggle. I know a lot of people who move to New York and know people and then just like, boom, it's like happening. I also know some people who move to like places like Atlanta, Chicago, they audition and book all the time. My friend Sasha, like I met her, she was living in um, Texas, I think. I met her doing a, a commercial in Seattle. She moved to Atlanta. She booked Black Panther and like three TV shows, two commercials, like, you know, but that that's because like, she knew that she she knew people in, in Atlanta and she knew that like her connections were gonna were gonna help her. So I think it's just about like researching the market. You know, for me, I've been in New York for 11 years. I have considered going to different markets because as somebody with a disability, I know that I can sell that. Um, and I know that there are not many places with like um, a very saturated uh, market of actors with disabilities. So if I go to a place like Vancouver or something, I'm going to be the, the one, you know, with a prosthetic leg who has experience in, in commercials, let's say. So it's, it's like um, business, you know, uh, considerations and, and, and where you're happy. Can I do a follow up on that one, Tony? Because I, I, you know, I, I, I struggle with this answer with the students sometimes, because I really feel like you, you have to go where you want to go. That there is no starter city. Going to Chicago is not a starter for New York and LA because it's a different market. It operates differently. You make connections in a different way. Auditions operate differently. So by the time you learn Chicago to pick up and then go to New York, you're starting over in New York. Yeah. And then you pick up, and not that people don't go, oh, I was in Chicago for five years, and then I finally moved to LA because I was out there all the time working. But out there all the time working is a different move than I just am like. Yeah, it's not, I mean, and I think there's there's a strong temptation to think of uh, this career as like linear, like first I'll do this and then I'll do this and then I'll do this. You're living, you are living and living is, um, is not linear and, um, that's you know the the hardest lesson. It's like there's going to be a lot of ambiguity. Ambiguity. Let me tell you the story about this girl that I I'm very close friends with. So she moved to Austin, Texas. She was doing a bunch of Shakespeare in Austin. She booked like three national commercials. She made like one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in a year in Austin, Texas. She booked um, the role of Jackie Onassis in um, uh, a movie in like twenty. 16 or 2017 or whatever it was like a big movie that was in theater she played jackie kennedy in this story about jfk's assassination she met all of these people you know she went to award shows this and that living in austin then you know i think like zach efron actually told her to move to los angeles right so she is like i'm going to la i'm gonna be a movie star now she moves to la does not book a thing for like two years right? No commercials, no movies, no TV shows. She moves back to Austin and starts booking again. So it's, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I guess the takeaway there is just like every market is different. She had a certain kind of cachet in the Austin market that she did not have in LA. Yeah, I think you have to know yourself and you have to be able to thrive where you, you plant. And so and maybe that's part of it, maybe she was just happier in Austin. So the thing that she was bringing, people yeah, want putting on camera was had some something. Maybe. Um, though that's those these are good questions. It's a good conversation. It's my theme of this this class that you know you're you're living. Because I think actors sometimes forget that it's a life that they are they are choosing and not just work. And so yes, you're always in the hustle, yes, you're always on the grind, yes, you're trying to you know, book this and book that and do those things. But you also have to remember your living and, you know, you have to have all those other things. So I'm glad you brought that up because it's been a theme of our guests. Sure. That is, they, uh, they, 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 yeah, you're having a life.
Okay, who else? Who else has got a question we have? We only have about 10 minutes. My, I will we'll go with Mike Justice, who is a junior BFA music theater. And then Alexis looks like she has a follow-up. Hey, Mike. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, so I understand you had this time period where you decided like you wanted to step off from theater and then you decided to come back into it. When you decided to come back into it, uh, how did you go about doing that? Was it reaching out to like, you know, people you had been working with or was it really just starting over again? Well, I, I mean, I, I took a break. Um, I took a break after I like uh, was working for a couple of years out of college and had some, you know, just, just burnout. And, um, you know, some mental health shit as well, whatever, was working on that. Um, but I got back into it because a friend asked me to audition for this play. That's that. That was like the thing, and 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 one of his things was like, it's a musical. It's gonna be like a jukebox musical, but we're gonna use this like really crazy kind of like southern folk, hip hop artist's music. And he and this this artist was gonna be like a part of the production of the play. So I was like, that sounds fucking insane. I'm doing it. Um, and one of the uh, one of the the ways that I was gonna be auditioning was an absurdist surrealist. Uh, monologue that I had to write. So like, I was just like, yeah, I like, I have to do this, you know? So that, that was, you know, but again, I mean, and maybe that was like the best thing instead of trying to like really kind of hustle in more traditional commercial theater, because this was something that I was really excited about, you know? Okay, Alexis. Um, so you've talked about getting burnt out. How do you, how did you develop self-care to deal when you were burnt out? And then any advice you have for, you know, people who are coming and are already getting burnt out? Uh, therapy. <laughs> if you can, you know, if you can be on your parents' health insurance until you're whatever, like 26, yeah, get, get into therapy. And I, and I, and I, and it's not just for people who have, who struggle with mental health, but I think it's like in this economy, <laughs> Um, it's not just, I don't think it's just, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think therapy is like recommended just for people who struggle with mental health. I think it's good for everybody and who doesn't struggle with mental health, a little bit. but, um, so the question was mental health and burnout and burnout, because I think that people think of burnout as something that happens to people that are like, oh, I've been doing this for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. But it, like, as you said, you got a little burnout after you did Scrooge and you were still an undergraduate student. You were yes. still... 22. Well, and I, you know, I experienced that. I see that more in our students now than I used to. Yeah. Well, the world is more complicated. I think the world is definitely more complicated now. Yeah. Um, and, and we're more connected to negative news. You know, in, in, 2000, in 2007, when I was doing Scrooge, we didn't have little devices in our hands that we were like constantly glued to where we could like know everything all the time, the minute that it happens. We didn't know, you know, and, and also like, the market crashed in 2008 while I was on tour. People suddenly woke up to the fact that we are like slaves to capitalism. Everybody started talking about that suddenly and these, this feeling of being like totally oppressed and you know, whatever, like that suddenly happened in my first big job out of college. So like that was, you know, a big psychological and emotional weight. You guys are, probably very, probably really understand what I'm describing there. But one of the things that I like to do when I'm feeling burnt out is to let my agents know that I am feeling a little burnt out. I'm just going to need to be, I'm just, send me everything, send me all the breakdowns, send me all the auditions that you want, but I'm going to be a little bit more selective going forward. Um, I like to get, I mean, for me, it's like getting out into nature hanging out with my friends. Um, I meditate every day. I journal all the time. Um, um, eating, cooking, you know, drinking a glass of wine here and there. Weed helps me. Um, what else? Uh, exercise, like just the normal mental health, mental health stuff and just like not being afraid to, to take a little, take a few steps back. I think it's good for them to hear that, that you don't have to constantly be running. Joe, did you have your hand up? No. Okay, we're almost at time. So one last question, otherwise I'm gonna wrap it up. 
Yeah. Um, because I would a, a question. Anybody got anything? They're dying because y'all always do this as soon as they're gone. Then you have 27 questions and I'm not them. Well, you know uh, oh, Julie Cosette has one. I knew that was coming. Hi. Um so when you have like difficult um like interactions with people that you're working with or if like you're just not vibing with how like a job is going how do you like advocate for yourself respectfully but also like firmly yeah it's it's to me that is very important and i have learned this the hard way um that boundaries are very 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 important and you know i mean i'm i turned 35 recently and i just learned thank you i just learned that it is okay to tell people how you actually feel i just learned this like it's a hard lesson to learn uh for me it's like hey maybe like you said this thing to me and I, I totally, I, I totally don't think that you were trying to be aggressive or trying to be judgmental or whatever, but that's kind of how I'm taking it. And, you know, if we could just stay away from things like my body, my medical history, you know, the way I look, if you could just like, we just stay away from topics like that, that would just make me more comfortable. And we don't have to like have a big discussion about it. And I don't hold a grudge again, you know, like just normal boundaries, normal boundary stuff calmly asserting boundaries you know without backing down without kowtowing and without being too aggressive or attacky and you, and you wouldn't say that that has like interfered with your success with people at all yeah it has oh it, well you know that's the thing. it's like but you can't control how other people are going to respond to you you know having firm boundaries does not mean having like good like well communicated well articulated healthy boundaries like communicated in like a calm, compassionate way does not guarantee that the other person is not going to lash out, you know? And you just have to know like, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. Like I just expressed my discomfort or that my boundary of mine was crossed. And beyond that, it's kind of out of my control, you know? It hasn't happened often, but, um, you know, I've had, I, I was working on this off-Broadway show in 2017 it was the first revival of this play by Charles Ludlum that was being directed by Charles Ludlum's partner, former partner, his widower, basically. It was the first time that this play had been, had been revived, I guess. And I was playing the lead in it and I was playing the role that the director had played in the original production. This play, Charles Ludlum died doing this play, right? The director was so beyond brutal to me saying things like you were disgusting in that scene you like and this has ne this is the only time that this anything like this has ever happened you were disgusting in this scene i couldn't watch you there's a reason that monologue that usually gets applause did not get applause because you you know fucked it up and all of this i did not react well to that but, and I could have, you know, I could have, I could have, that's an option that I, that I didn't know in 2017 that I could have said, you know, I understand you are having a strong emotional reaction. If we could keep it constructive from now on, we had, you know, a week left of this play, but um, I had no control over the, how he was going to react. His stuff was his stuff. And that's always going to be true in every, in every relationship that I ever have. I can't control how other people are gonna treat me. I can't control how other people are going to respond to me, but I can control how I advocate for myself and the boundaries that I draw and the respect that I show to myself. Thank you. I think this is a really super important conversation and I'm, I'm glad you bring it up, Tony. And, and we'll, we're gonna talk about this some more, I think in the class, because the great thing about your generation and, and, and the generation that's coming up behind you versus mine was we were taught to just take it. And that was a really unhealthy, very toxic um, world to live in as young actors yeah. to just say, we're just supposed to suck it up and let those, those layers of scars take place. 
um, and then and then frankly, then shower it down on the next generation, our pain, um, because that's inevitable. And I really am very um, happy that that this shift has taken place in the new millennium, where people are, even if it's a struggle, advocating for themselves. And like Tony said, even if that person lashes out, I think we're going to get to a place where this that the normal thing, the normalcy around the normalization of boundaries and appropriate behavior, that just becomes the thing. And we don't have to worry about that. And the, and the, the few people that do lash out or treat us poorly, um, they are the ones that are, are the outliers versus the, but y'all are, are in this middle ground, right? We're traveling towards a better place. So it, I, I, I realize it's a struggle, but I just thought about this because, you know, we just had the, all these reports about, um, you know, heads of BFA music theater people, having auditions for perspectives online as we're all doing and them saying awful things to these poor high school students who are auditioning. And to me, that seems like abhorrent, but then I flash back to that, that used to be normal. And I'm sure that that person is probably older than I am of a different generation and they just haven't kind of caught on, but they will and they will be, they will be forced to over time. Yeah. Um, I thought that was great advice, Tony. Um, anybody have one last, cause we're at time, but anybody have one last thing they just have to get from Tony um, thank you so much. Okay, so I'm gonna put it back because I wanna be able to see your face. Um, and I'm so old I can't when you're small. Um, so, so Tony, thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. You are so gracious and, and, and um, responding to me when I asked. And, um, and it's so great to have you back here even if it's virtually on campus. Um, I cherish the time that we spent together. I think this was an exciting time that you spent with our students today and I really appreciate it. And I, we will definitely spend time together next time I'm in New York. Please, please. I, I, I just am so, I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you guys like Wesleyan and Scott meant so much to me and still do. And um, it just means a lot that, it means a lot that I, that you even asked me to do this. And um, oh, I, like I think the best people to talk to the people that are, I say this all the time when I'm, whether it's a recruiting event or people are asking me about what's special about Wesleyan, I'm like, well, it's not the facilities and it's not, I mean, and I mean, you know, they're still, as, they're still pretty much like they were when you were here. Um, um, it's, it's not, it's something about this place attracts a certain kind of person, a certain kind of artist, a certain sort of scholar, it's the students. And I can connect somebody who graduated in, you know, 2007 with somebody who graduated last year and y'all are going to have so much in common it's very strange yeah. but i could also do that with somebody who graduated in like the 60s and you're still gonna have so much in common there it's it's a weird phenomenon and i i just think it's really special when they get to hear from people who walk the same halls they did and and you know kiss the stage after their senior performance and because we still do it yeah. uh, i i mean i i yeah i feel the same way and i i do feel you know connected to you guys and I, I put my email in the chat so take it and email me literally with anything or and anytime thank you so much thank you so much for being so gracious and thank you for being so giving and i love you much and we will talk soon okay bye guys thank you